Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and joining me as always is my co-host from Long Island, New York, Austin Davidson. Heyo. It's season two, episode 23. We'll get right into things. It's Steelers Ravens week and boy, what a what a good time for the Steelers to face a quality AFC opponent because, you know, they don't have to worry about playing such bad teams like, oh, wait, they lost to the Bears. That's right. Oh, that's right. Well, we already got we already tore the Steelers apart a lot for their loss last week, but uh, there was a game last night. Austin, did you get to see any of it? It was the Packers and Bears. I I did I did actually get to see it. I got to be mad at work when I found out that Ty Montgomery went down and that he left with a chest injury. And then I got home and got to watch the rest of the show and got to watch the Bears actually throw. And I didn't know they could do that. And when they did, they're really bad at it. So. It, it was it's it was a fun time. Did you get to watch the game? No, I uh, my roommates weren't very interested in watching the game, and honestly, I wasn't too keen on watching the Bears because I knew they weren't going to play well, and that was just going to make me all the more upset that the Steelers lost in the fashion that they did. So no, I didn't. Uh, I did not uh, watch the game. Although I did hear that there was a delay thanks to thunder and lightning. I feel like that's the third time that's happened this year, or something like that. Really, I honestly, I haven't heard any of that. that. That was the first time hearing it for me. I think it might have been the preseason games is where we saw that mostly, but I feel like I've heard that a lot so far. But anywho, the uh, sorry, the Ty Montgomery injury, which you had forementioned, uh, sparked some interesting debate on Twitter as D'Angelo Williams uh, tweeted that uh, he was potentially available to be signed by the Packers for their starting running back position, but. Uh, the injuries to Ty Montgomery and Jamal Williams are reportedly not too serious, so the Packers haven't brought in any running backs. So is D'Angelo Williams done in the NFL? Uh, I, I got to think so. I think, um, I mean, unless more running back injuries happened again, I felt like the Packers were the best shot since the Packers, I think, ranked 30th in rushing in, in the uh, league. So. I feel like this would have been his chance. If they're not going to give him a chance, I think it's basically over for him. What do you think? I think if they don't, if he doesn't find a team within the next few weeks, it's likely over. I mean, you're not going to bring in a, a new player to your team post, you know, week five or six and expect them to learn the entire offense as a starting player. So, I mean, if he signs with the team, it's going to be in a backup role, certainly not as a third stringer who would have to play special teams so sadly i think uh, we're nearing the end of the road for d'angelo williams uh, elsewhere in the game i didn't see the hit but i heard Devonte adams uh packers receiver took a vicious hit from danny trevathan last night uh reportedly has had movement in all his extremities and uh tweeted that he was home safe uh last night he he does have a concussion though uh, I'm gonna check out the hit right now. What were your initial thoughts on the hit, on the hit and the in- subsequent injury? Sorry. Uh, my first words out of my mouth was, "He is dead." Like, it was a really, really nasty hit. Like I, I wasn't being serious when he is dead, but was saying he is dead. But it was a rough, uh, rough hit straight to the frontal lobe of the head. So that was really rough. And immediately right after it happened, everyone was waving for uh, someone to get on the field. The bears, the the Packers fighting ensued between the Packers and Danny Trevathan. And it was just nasty. It was just really, really bad. Uh, Other than that, Oh, I I don't think there's much else to say. There's, uh, there's almost no doubt in my head that Danny Trevathan is going to be suspended because on the play, Devontae Adams was already wrapped up. And basically stopped, and he kind of just, uh, he came flying in there. I really don't think it was intentional. A lot of people are playing it, playing it like he's really, uh, he really meant to hurt him. I, I never think that's really the case, but uh, it was just nasty. Did you get to watch it now? I am looking at it right now. This is the definition of a, geez, I don't even know how to, how to call this. This is one of the more vicious hits I think I've ever seen. Um I definitely think you could call that a targeting penalty, Austin. That's something you would get you would get ejected for in college football. Uh, I know he hadn't been completely wrapped up, so the play was not completely over. But going after his head like that, whether or not he was head hunting, you have to be smarter about how you're gonna you know finish off a guy. And he went right for his head. That's a absolutely a fine and 
most likely suspension. Just looking on the replay here, I feel like I'm seeing Devontae Adams' helmet, like, bend. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing it bend on this hit, which is, oh, that's, like, I don't even know, like, how to say it. That's just, there. there's so, only so many ways to put it, but it's certainly ugly is one way I would put it. Um, definitely worthy of a suspension. Uh, that's all I'm going to say on the matter. So we'll, we'll see what the league office hands out to him uh, next week. But uh, moving on, TJ Watt and Stefan Tuit are expected to return to action this week. How big is their return to the lineup? The Steelers' pass rush is licking their lips, looking how poorly the Ravens' line did last week. And with the return of TJ Watt and Tuit, the Ravens might be up against even more trouble on that front than they did last week. In all honesty, though, these aren't even the most important returns, though. The defense doesn't need much help in, for this game. The offense, however, that's another story. But how big is uh, TJ Watt and Stefan Tuit returning for you? Well, it's definitely huge on... Uh, the defensive line, because although Tyson Alawalu has played well, Stefan Tuitt has been a difference maker over the last couple of years, particularly in uh, the two snaps that he played this year. He he played really well, and yeah, it's two snaps, but you like to think that it, it's, it, it was a good sign. And yeah, he might not be the best overall defensive lineman that Cameron Hayward is, since he's probably a better pass rusher, but I think Tuitt might have become at least early on, it looked like he might have become the most dominant defensive lineman on this team. And he's definitely a big, strong man. And uh, his ability to help set the edge on the run will be key. Uh, TJ Watt will definitely be an upgrade over Anthony Ciccolo. Uh, Ciccolo had a sack last week, but he repeatedly struggled with setting the edge on the run. And that was where the Steelers got beat most last week. Uh, Ciccolo's a fine player. It's nice to have him around, but uh, he's a backup for a reason, and I think uh, getting T.J. Watt back will be huge, and hopefully he can play a large portion of the snaps, but I wouldn't be surprised if he gets held for uh, to limited action, at least in this week. But in any case, getting them both back will be huge for the Steelers' defense, uh, especially for you know stopping the run, but they also add an element in rushing the passer, so that's a, that's certainly important as well. Uh, beyond that, I want to jump back to some other NFL news. Uh, did you see what happened with uh, Odell Beckham Jr.'s touchdown celebration last week? I did. He reenacted uh, a dog making yellow snow. Well, uh, as of yesterday, he was fined $12,000 for that celebration. I just wanted to see what you thought about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that eh. It's, I don't know. I feel like just because it was Odell, it was it was overplayed. But, I mean, it was kind of a ridiculous celebration. It's kind of like you were told you could do more celebrations, but you kind of took it a bit too far. But I honestly didn't care. But I, I don't know. I feel like people that watch football are an interesting bunch because they get offended over very little things. Yeah, like but that. it's it's also a dog urinating. It, that's, that, that's what he's reenacting. It's one thing if he's doing something else, but he's – reenacting an animal using the bathroom. Travis I f- Kelsey's done worse. <laughs> I mean, Travis Kelsey's an idiot, though. <laughs> You're right. I, I can't stand that guy. I do not like him at all, but <sighs> whatever. <laughs> Back to Steelers news. Ben Roethlisberger in his press conference earlier in the week blamed the Steelers' poor offensive start on him. Is it really mostly his fault, and what does he need to do differently to get the offense going? No, 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 no. That's not the thing you do as a leader. You take the blame because it's the classy move. In reality, I put most of the blame on Juju Smith-Schuster, Martavis Bryant, Eli Rogers, and poor play calling. Yes, Ben has made some inaccurate throws, but it seems like the only person that's getting open is Antonio Brown. And it's shown in the stat that Ben does worse when targeting those receivers like it's not even like uh ben doesn't look at these guys it's that ben tries to get the ball to them and it's just not as open they simply aren't as good as brown and that's not that awful because brown's the best wide receiver in the nfl but they don't even try fighting as hard and it makes it hard for roethlisberger i don't blame roethlisberger for force feeding antonio brown the ball because these other guys are just doing so poorly. Uh, then, not to mention the running game hasn't gotten going this year. 
So it's being forced to throw. And then on top of it, the Steelers have been penalized so many times. He's been forced to throw for over 10 yards for so many first downs. It's just been awful. The whole offense is performing ugly, and most of it, uh, in my eyes, is not on him, actually. actually. Then what does he need to do differently? He just kind of needs to just, I, I, I don't even know what to call it, just focus? Because he's just been inaccurate at times, and it just seems odd. Like, he's been, he threw, on one of the plays that Antonio Brown actually caught it, he threw low and behind Brown. Luckily, Brown is great, so he caught it anyway, but it, it wasn't like it was a really rough throw where he was fitting it into a tight space. It was just kind of like a normal average throw. I mean, the guy was out in coverage on Brown, but still, it was just not that good. Just Rossberg just has to get shake off whatever he's got going and just go back to throwing accurately, but... uh so, do you, uh, do you think this is mostly Roethlisberger's fault? And if, if so, what does he have to do differently? No, I don't think it's mostly his fault. I'm I'm going to have a bit of a different tone and view on this uh, on on this uh, story, but I I do see your point. I I do have to agree with you. the The rest of the offense has been pretty poor. I mean, it's definitely not just him. I think the offensive line has been the most disappointing part of this this offense right now, and it's not for pass protection. They've been pretty solid in pass protection, uh, especially considering uh, one of the opponents they played in the Vikings. But you know, I think I think about Ben Roethlisberger, and I see a lot of those balls that are just not being placed very well. Uh, yeah, it's 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 not all on him, but there are things I think he could definitely do better. Uh, like you said, maybe maybe stop. I don't know if it's he if he's overthinking it, but sometimes I feel like he's too locked on to Antonio Brown. Which yeah, that that might sound strange given the fact that Brown is the best receiver in football, and he's got those great numbers when targeting Brown. But in case in point, uh, I saw some film from uh, the Bears game last week. The play where Roethlisberger got stripped, I believe it was the first quarter, and the Bears recovered. Brown had been running a a route, and Roethlisberger was just glued, like looking right at him the entire time, was stepping up in the pocket, and there were, I believe it was Jesse James was open, it could have been someone else, but they were open, and Roethlisberger didn't even look their way, and just held onto the ball, just kind of waiting for Brown to do his thing and get open, but, you know, it was too late, and he got stripped, uh, you know, this, this isn't an every every time sort of thing. You know, as you mentioned, there have been penalties. The other receivers have been vastly disappointing for the most part. Uh, Le'Veon Bell's had trouble getting going, which, like I said, is the offensive line's fault. But I think for Roethlisberger, it's just it's it's got to be a more simplistic approach. Uh, take more of what the defense gives you. Uh, just because you can't get it to Antonio Brown on every play doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I mean, in week two, the other receivers got involved. We saw Martavis Bryant and Eli Rogers get their catches in, and they, they looked pretty good in doing it. Uh, so I think maybe maybe it's just a road problem. Maybe that's been the problem for Roethlisberger on the road is that he seeks out Antonio Brown a little too much. Maybe just tone it back uh... a little bit. See if you can get – someone else uh the football a little bit you know maybe the key here is that's when you get Le'Veon Bell the ball split out wide maybe that's what it is the other thing I know is that he tried to cut down on his interceptions this year and he has done a good job so far of having only thrown one which was a tip pass uh they've stopped throwing to the intermediate middle of the field uh so you remember a lot of those play action fakes where they have the quick hitting pass to the tight end over the middle you remember those Austin I don't seem to recall them running that play this year. Do you think you've seen that? No, not at least not commonly. Maybe one play, but not that I could remember. I know that Roethlisberger tends to get picked on those types of plays a lot, but at the same time, a lot of the Steelers' big plays have come from there in the past. So I think the Steelers, it might behoove them to try going there a little more often. And for Roethlisberger, again, just simplify your approach. Uh, you don't have to get it to Brown every time. So don't force it. But at the same time, I have to recognize that it really is, it certainly is not all his fault. In fact, if anything, he's been one of the better players, I guess. And he, he hasn't been great, but it's certainly not on him. Which leads us to the preview for the game. 
The Steelers' offense, which we were just talking about, they have their toughest task of the season so far, don't they? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is the real deal for the offense, and uh, frankly, I'm scared. Uh, the Ravens' defense is no joke, and for the offense not have been so good to start the season, the outlook isn't bright. Uh, to the Steelers' advantage, the Ravens will be without uh, defensive tackle Brandon Williams, who has been excellent on run-stuffing, as well as defensive end Brent Urban, who just got placed on IR. But that only matters if Le'Veon can get going here, which he hasn't really had that big game yet all year. But here's hoping it begins on Sunday. Uh, the only one That's only one piece of the puzzle, though. Ravens have a very scary secondary with Eric Weddle and Tony Jefferson at safety and Brandon Carr and Jimmy Smith as the starting cornerbacks. Uh, this will be the first real challenge for the passing offense, which has already struggled, so that's awful to look forward to. Uh, Brown might be the only player who comes to play again this week as as uh, Ben typically doesn't really do well against Baltimore besides the one six uh, touchdown game that happened now two years ago I want to say not three years ago it was 2014 three. it was okay and uh, everyone other than Brown ha- has been very inconsistent there's one place there's one place on offense where the Steelers will have a clear advantage and that's the offensive line specifically in pass blocking the Baltimore pass rush isn't that great, and the line is done pretty well in pass blocking when the starters are there. And it just so happens to be that Foster has already said he is playing despite being uh, questionable in the outlook for Gilbert playing as bright, uh, which would mean the whole starting offensive line is playing again. And they should be able to give Ben enough time to try and read the very good defense. Uh, but uh, before we switch over to, uh, switch over to you, do you want to do injury report really uh, first? I, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped over that. Yeah, go. Uh, let's go back to that quickly. Yep. So, uh, Sean Davis is uh, questionable with an ankle injury. Ramon Foster is questionable with a thumb injury, but he said he's playing. Uh, Marcus Gilbert is questionable with a hamstring. He is also probable to play. Uh, James Harrison was is questionable with illness. And safety Mike Mitchell is, is uh, questionable with Hamstring. Well, for the Ravens, cornerback Jalen Hill is out. Uh, defensive tackle Brandon Williams is out with a foot injury. Tight end Max Williams is out with an ankle injury. And then tight end ben- Benjamin Watson is questionable with a calf. So let's hear your offensive preview. First, what? how big of a deal would it be for the Steelers to lose Sean Davis for this game? Because I know it's a big deal. They don't have Brandon Williams, which is a big deal. I'll get to that. I didn't realize he wasn't playing, but... Uh, I didn't realize Sean Davis was on the injury report. I, I knew he was hurt, but I guess I didn't know that. I think he didn't participate in practice today is what I thought it was. Uh, uh, I think it would be a pretty big deal. Uh, uh, I th- Actually, you know what? I, I don't know who, if they would move J.J. Wilcox over or if they would be starting Robert Golden there. But honestly, I feel comfortable with, with either one of those. I mean, I know they're not great, but it, I feel like – the defense has an easier job this week. But, but I'd hope not to jinx it here, but I don't think the defense losing people is really that big of a deal this week. I, I honestly think with TJ Watt and, and Stefan Tuitt returning, I think that would even make up for it just in itself. So what do you yeah. think? This would be a good week for uh, Sean Davis to miss. I think kind of like last week, the focus is going to be on the defensive front so the secondary while important obviously is not going to be tested as often I believe because I don't think Joe Flacco is going to have enough time to throw the deep ball but we'll get to that back on the other side of the ball uh look it's just been a bad matchup year in and year out for the Steelers uh rushing attack uh the Ravens pride themselves on having a tough physical defensive front and they like to kind of overwhelm you at the point of attack on the strong side of the ball uh, so it would kind of behoove the Steelers to see what the Jaguars and Leonard Fournette did in London last week. A lot of slower, longer developing misdirection plays were keys for the Jaguars offense. Uh, the Ravens have typically been aggressive and uh, that hurt them last week. Uh, the Steelers have also made a habit of wasting downs running right into the strength of this uh, Ravens defense over the years. Look at last week or sorry last year with Le'Veon Bell only rushing for 32 yards. So it's time to take a page from the Jaguars playbook and run those long counters, run those weak side handoffs, and make the linebackers stay at home. Don't let them commit to the strong side. And then 
once they've started to respect those plays, it might open up some longer uh, runs on the power and ISO plays. Uh, hopefully a bounce back game from the offensive line will give Bell the room that he needs to open up the passing game. Uh, you know, so far this season on the road, it's been a lot of Antonio Brown and a little bit of Jesse James from the opener. Uh, you know, Roethlisberger's done a good job in finding Brown this season, like we were talking about, but I think he's been too locked on onto him at times and he needs to start maybe <sighs> he has put trust in other receivers, but they also haven't come through, but I want to see him start going a little over the intermediate middle some more. And uh, yes, we, I talked about the interceptions and the turnovers, but I feel like the Steelers have not had, as, they definitely haven't had as many big plays. In fact, the Steelers are on pace to have the lowest offensive, uh, total offensive numbers in a season that they've ever had with Ben Roethlisberger at quarterback. So I think Roethlisberger needs to start getting guys like Eli Rogers and Vance McDonald more involved over the middle. Those guys need more targets for sure. On the other side of the ball, things should, again, should be easy for the Steelers' defense. But then again, we were also saying that last week, weren't we? Yeah, the Steelers going to have to pull it back together for this game, though. Because it would be really embarrassing to be torn apart by the 32nd ranked offense in the league. And they might have to carry the offense to victory since all their matchups are favorable, while offense has not-so-favorable matchups. Uh, the Ravens' offensive line has lost key piece Marshall Yonda, and they just look awful without him against the Jaguars. Granted, the Jaguars' pass rush is actually pretty decent with Clyde's Campbell, uh, but it, uh, still, it seemed like Flacco was under pressure on every play. So if the Steelers could actually contain the run game this week and make Flacco have to sit and throw in the pocket, the, the Steelers could just go crazy with sacks and quarterback hits here. Uh, other than that, the, the only offensive weapon the Ravens have in the passing game is tight end Benjamin Watson. And he's listed as questionable for this game, so more than likely he won't even be at 100%. So, And even uh, then, that's the one guy the Steelers really need to worry about. Uh, wide receivers Jeremy Macklin and Mike Wallace might have been scary in 2012, so if it was five years ago, but uh, both these receivers are both past their prime. But if I had to pick one to be more of a threat, it's probably Macklin. Uh, and still, just not that scary <laughs> then Flacco seems to be playing slightly below average for him and that's good news especially for Joe Hayden who picked him off twice last year and those were Joe Hayden's only two picks of last year uh finally the Ravens have Terrence West and Buck Allen as their running backs and honestly they've been doing decently and we've seen what a two-back system can do to the Steelers so they will need to be held in check but anyway almost all the matchups are favorable here for the defense so here's hoping that it plays out like that. Uh, what is your preview for the defense like? Well, the Ravens, I will say they must be encouraged by watching the Steelers-Bears tape from last week. The one thing the Ravens offense has done well enough you know, to be sustainable this year has been the long stretch uh, zone run to the outside, and that's all the Bears needed to win last week on offense. So for the Steelers defense, it's pretty simple. I think you covered it pretty well. Uh, don't get beat by the outside zone. Uh, for years now, the Ravens have been able to gash the Steelers by finding running room on the outside. Uh, those runs definitely are worse when the Steelers compound the issues by not being able to bring down the running back on the first try, and that's where their play from the first two weeks need to return. Uh, they can't miss tackles like they missed last week, and if they can wrap up and set the edge effectively, the Ravens won't be able to establish the running game, and there's certainly no reason to think that Joe Flacco is going to be able to go back there and beat the Steelers himself. Uh, you know, it's pretty much just Joe Flacco back there. Uh, you know, Benjamin Watson won't be at 100%. He's not even that great. I think he's a solid player, don't get me wrong, but, I mean, they have the, the deep threats in Macklin and uh, Mike Wallace, but I think back to Mike Wallace's game against the Steelers last year I think he had over 100 yards well yeah but 95 came on one play because Mike Mitchell forgot how to tackle uh I mean he has three catches for 21 yards in three games this year uh Flacco definitely does not have the time to get the ball deep because his offensive line has been uh I don't even know if there's a right word to use for how many offensive linemen the Ravens have lost this year. I feel like they they I feel like their entire starting line is practice squad players. I almost feel bad for them. They've lost so many guys. So you'd have to think that the key is getting those guys the ball downfield and the only way they'll be able to do that is with play action fakes. So stop the run. 
Uh, time to man up after last week. Dust yourself off. They can play better. This is not a good offense, and there's a lot of indicators for that. So the Steelers' defense should, again, should have a big week. Uh, special teams, though, is an interesting area. John Harbaugh, a former special teams coordinator, has generally gotten the better of Mike Tomlin in this area. So after last week's performance, even special teams was not impressive. What are they going to have to do differently this week? Uh, not take kick returns anywhere or try to take them anywhere. Uh, it was it was fun in games making fun of it the past like three weeks, but seeing them up punt uh, last week, I'd really like to actually see just more calling for the ball, fair catching it. Uh, other than that, with the offense uh, about to probably have the worst time of the year, uh, Barry Barry might have to have a top day as well as Boswell. The Steelers can't move far into Ravens territory, so the the punter and the kicker of the Steelers are both gonna have to have big days for the special teams if the uh, offense really gets shut down. I would agree with you. The only other thing I'll say is as far as punt returns, Eli Rogers makes me nervous now, kind of like how Marcus Wheaton did that one playoff game in Denver when Antonio Brown was out. Might be better to just rush 11 guys and try to block every punt. Anywho, uh, let's move on to our keys to the game. We got one for each side, the Steelers' offense and defense. So what's your key for the Steelers' offense going into Sunday's game? Uh, so force the Ravens to rush four or more to get any pressure. If the Steelers want to be able to pass in this game, the offensive line is going to have to do really well in pass blocking and force the Ravens to try and send more to apply pressure, opening up Antonio Brown and as well as Bell out of the backfield since there will be less in coverage. What is your offensive key to the game? I mentioned it earlier with Ben Roethlisberger. Take what the defense gives you. The Ravens are a great defensive team, and traditionally they try to make the Steelers – grind out those long, tough drives to score points. They don't like giving up the big play, and that means the Steelers are going to have to sit back and accept, you know what, we're not going to be able to score You know those big, hard-hitting plays. We're going to have to accept that we're going to need to go 10 plays, 14 plays, eat up a, a bunch of clock, and use Le'Veon Bell to tire out the defense. Then, once you've done that, if you've done it well, embrace that challenge and then go for the knockout punches. Uh, your defense should be able to get you the ball back a few times in this game, so you don't have to score on every play. Even a long, a long drive that takes up a lot of time and gets you three points might be a win sometimes. So you don't have to get a you know five plays, seventy-five yards, and have a bunch of yards on the way to the end zone and just a few plays. It's okay to have a long grinded out drive. On the other side of the ball, what's the key for the Steelers' defense? Stick to the fundamentals and just tackle. It seems like such a stupid key, but it's serious when it comes to the Steelers' defense. The Steelers struggle with tackling again like they did last week. The Ravens' similar two-back system will tear apart this defense, just as the Bears did just last week. This matchup is favorable. Don't make it unfavorable. Uh, What's your defensive key? Set the edge. You know the outside zone is coming. It's it's simple. If you can set the edge and don't let them get outside, that means they only have a few places to go. They can cut it back to the backside, or they can take a potentially a couple lanes to the inside, which is where your defense is. So as long as your guys are filling, which they will eventually if they don't have to worry about getting outside, that that's why James Harrison was so good for so many years. He was underappreciated until he wasn't around or wasn't playing as often is that he sets the edge very well. That's something Anthony Ciccolo struggled with last week. That's something that really helped once Bud Dupree returned to the lineup last year against Buffalo. They helped the top-ranked rushing offense to, I think it was something under 75 yards. I mean, you and I were there, Austin, when he came back. It was big when he came back, and James Harrison was good at it too, and T.J. Watt was good at it in week one. So it's big time for the Steelers' offense to set the edge. So that's my key to the game on off, sorry defense. So now, uh, consequently, we'll move on to our X factors and who's the one guy on offense that has to have a big day. Uh, for me, it's Bell. Since 2013, Bell has the most scrimmage yards in October, which is an odd stat. But this game is October 1st, so I'm hoping this trend continues and we'll see uh, Bell get going here. If he doesn't, it's going to force the offense to pass the whole time again. It's just not favorable at all, making Bell the easy X factor. Just to mention it, uh, Bell. Ha- only had 32 yards in Baltimore uh, last year, and that was that was uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, oh, where did my mind go? Oh, that was the loss. I'm sorry. I, my my, my uh, mind lost track. Uh, that was the loss. But when they came back to Pittsburgh and he had over 100, that's when they won. So it's obvious that how well Bell does is going to really help the Steelers win here. So what's your offensive X factor? Mine is Eli Rogers, and you ripped on him for good reason last week. He didn't even have a target. And, yeah, that's partially Ben Roethlisberger's fault for not throwing his way. But you can bet Eli Rogers is pretty frustrated with not getting a chance to catch the ball. Uh, Last year in Baltimore, uh, I could be wrong, but I believe he had his career best game, which went over 100 yards, which I also believe you called, if I'm not mistaken. I uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I'll let you verify that. But Rodgers could have a big game here, and I think that he comes back in a big way for the Steelers' offense. He, he needs to start working over the middle again, get him involved, open up the middle of the field, and that'll open up the rest of the offense. Uh, first of all, can you confirm that, and then tell me who your defensive X factor is? I honestly can't remember. I, t- I tried going on to find it, to find that uh episode script but i i can't remember if i called it i do remember i i I can confirm that was probably uh that was his best game he had 106 yards but i I can't remember if i called that or not i'll i I don't want to take credit for uh what i don't know if i did well you know what we can uh look for it after the episode is complete and we'll uh we'll confirm it then sounds good all right so for my uh, defensive X Factor, it's Javon Hargrave, or technically it's the coaching, but uh, after talking about Hargrave disappearing the other day, uh, statistics came out that he only, he's only playing around 18% of snaps for the defense, which is just wasting talent because when he's out there, he's a bulldozer. It's amazing to think that he's only played 18% of snaps and still has two sacks. Just think about that. He or Keith Butler is my X Factor because he can make a difference if he plays. So who is your defensive X Factor? I thought that was eighteen percent of nickel snaps. Oh, okay. Well, I, that, I might have I might have misread that it, very wrong. I mean, however way you look at it, eighteen percent of the snaps in nickel is still not much because essentially that's what the base defense is in the NFL now. So that means Hargrave is basically playing not even a fifth of the plays in the base defense. So that means he's playing in the three four and probably a little bit in sub package and nickel which also means he's getting vastly underutilized which is you said it that's that can't happen this this young man's too good i mean why why'd you draft him that high if you're gonna play him you know let's say he's even he's playing all those snaps plus the other ones we just talked about that's still probably something like 40 percent of the snaps that's inexcusable austin i'm sorry but but you're absolutely right that that can't happen <sighs> Uh, I'll stick with the defensive line for my X-Factor. It's going to be Stefan Tuitt returning from injury, and I think he's really going to help the run defense, like I said. We know he's a great all-around player, but I think his ability to push the offensive lineman back and set the edge on those outside zones are really going to help the Steelers in their rush defense on Sunday. So now we can move on to our bold predictions. It's Steelers, it's Ravens, it's got to be some some sort of bold predictions. What are yours, Austin? First one, Joe Hayden gets a pick six. Then uh, Le'Veon Bell gets it going and gets 163 skip, scrimmage yards and two touchdowns, which both are rushing. Then uh, the Steelers get six sacks this game, one from Shazier, two from Hayward, one from Hargrave, one from Watt, and one from Vince Williams. And that is my final pr- bull prediction. So what are yours? I have Ben Roethlisberger finally has a big game. He goes for three touchdowns and 300 yards and no picks. I think T.J. Watt has three sacks and an interception, and I have, uh, sorry, Eli Rogers going for nine receptions for 150 yards and two touchdowns. Crazy numbers, I know, but, you know, I I was looking at them quickly, and I was like, you know, they're not bold enough, so let me go bolder. So what is your final score prediction for this next reiteration, or I guess uh, I'm blanking on the term, of the Steelers-Ravens rivalry? Steelers winning this 21 to 17 in a really tough match. I think it's going to be the Steelers coming back from behind as well. Just a, and that's not really a bold prediction. It's just more of just a, a, a bit of a prediction. So what is your final score prediction? Ooh, I love a late game winning drive. I have a, the Steelers winning 23, 20. Thanks to a late Chris Boswell field goal. 
look, there's a reason these games are always one score games. They're they're both good teams and they're always very competitive. Uh, the Steelers offense has averaged, I think, 14 points in Baltimore since 2012. The last time the Steelers won in Baltimore, Charlie Batch was the Steelers quarterback. The last time Ben Roethlisberger won a game there, 2010, the year the Steelers last went to the Super Bowl. So the Steelers are overdue for a win there. And, uh, you know, I love I love watching Steelers Ravens. I posted my first article. I don't know if you got a chance to check it out, Austin, on our website. Uh, just my personal uh, my personal list of the Steelers' top five wins over the Ravens since 2007. Uh, a lot of games I've loved watching, and uh, you know they're both great teams. And I you love to hate the Ravens, but you know they're a great team as well. It's it's nice to have them around to play because gosh, how much better is it to play them you know three times a year than play the Bengals three times a year? Yeah, yeah, the Bengals are are not. It's not as a fun game. Not not even close. Might you say trash? Oh, I would say trash. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's let's get back to our around the league pickums. So do you have uh, last week's statistics from uh, our pickums? I do. Uh, overall, last week uh, you went five and nine, and I went six and nine, uh, oh. bringing you up to thirteen and seventeen, and me to thirteen and eighteen. Uh, we both we didn't predict it. But we would all we would be at fourteen right each if uh, if we count the Green Bay because neither of us were gonna pick an upset there. We both thought Green Bay was gonna win, but we I, I kept it off only because we didn't call it on the podcast. But more more than likely we would have called that. So that's where we are at. Okay, feel free to give me a five and ten last week because I I, I see I mi- missed one of the games. Uh, just give me the L there. I'll take it. All right. All right. So based on our final score predictions, uh, the Steelers are three-point favorites going into Baltimore. We both have the Steelers covering there. Uh, New Orleans at Miami. The Saints are three-point favorites on the road. Who you got? I have the Saints covering. Even though the Dolphins have been terrible on offense. I, I think the Saints have one of the worst defenses in NFL history right now, so I'll take the Dolphins plus three. Uh, Drew Brees over Jay Cutler, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day for me. Rams at Cowboys. Even though the Rams are upstart, the Cowboys are six-and-a-half-point favorites at home. That kind of seems like a lot, doesn't it? It really does, especially with how the Rams have been performing. I know they're. I, I specifically have said they're not great, but I feel like the Cowboys aren't that good. I felt like the Cowboys have been underperforming for what they were last year as well. So I don't know. I have the Rams winning outright in this game in a surprise upset. So what do you have? I'll actually have the Cowboys covering. I think their backs are kind of against the wall, particularly on the offensive line. They haven't performed as well as they probably should have, and I think they're going to – come out and they're going to really beat up the Rams on offense. So I think the Cowboys are going to win. Maybe not in super convincing fashion, but I think it'll be more than six and a half points. Detroit travels to Minnesota. The Lions had a heartbreaking loss last week, uh, and they get the suddenly the red-hot Case Keenum. The Vikings are two-point favorites at home. Who do you got? I have the Lions winning outright. I, I really think the Lions are the better team here. I think Case Keenum can keep up that charade forever even and even if it's sam bradford i still hold that the lines will win outright but it's it's really looking like it's gonna be another case keenum outing here so lions who do you got the lions proved to me last week that they're a legitimate team they really should have beaten the atlanta falcons at the very least they should have had one more chance i think i i didn't i don't like that rule the play the play with the 10 second runoff should not end the game in my opinion but that's for another time they showed me that they can play with the NFC champion, and that gives them points in my book. And, yeah, I know the Vikings played well last week, but I, I still think that their offense is not good enough. So I'll have the Lions winning outright. Tennessee Titans at the Houston Texans. The Titans are a point-and-a-half favorite on the road. Who do you got? Titans covering for me. How about for you? The Texans should have beaten the Patriots last week. I'll take the Texans to win outright. Jaguars at Jets. The Jags, coming off a huge win in London, are three-and-a-half-point favorites on the road to take on the Jets. Mm, You know what? I feel like it would be the most Jaguar thing ever 
to lose to the Jets right after blowing out a decent team. So I'm going to pick the Jets win outright. Really, that's interesting. This seems like a really kind of interesting trap game, doesn't it, though? Yep. I'm going to have to stick with the Jaguars, though. It's, I don't know, Leonard Fournette looks awesome. Although he's running into a tough defensive front, the more I think about it, the less I like this pick. I'll stick with it, though. I won't. I don't like it, but I'll stick with it. Ah, oh, what a snooze bowl here. Bengals at Browns. Bengals are three-point favorites on the road in Cleveland? Ah. Uh, <laughs> That's gross. Uh, I'm going to take the Browns winning out right, though. Who do you have? Someone has to win this game. I guess I'll take the Bengals plus three. I guess it'll be close. I hope. That's going to be a tie. <laughs> I, I get, yeah, that would be the – oh, my God. That would be the most <laughs> – Bengals and Browns thing ever. I kind of hope the Browns win this game. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I'll just take the Bengals plus three. Bills at Falcons. Falcons are eight-point favorites at home against the Bills, who just upset the Broncos last week. Uh, I have the Bills uh, keep on rolling. Not good enough, but I have the Bills plus eight. I have them keeping it close. What do you got? It's also like the Bills to look competitive and then get steamrolled by a team a couple weeks later. So I'll take the Falcons to cover. The Bills have had a good defense, but there's no way they can keep up with Matty Ice and the Falcons' offense. So the Falcons are going to storm all over them before late, before before long enough. Giants looking at an 0-4 start at Tampa Bay. The Buccaneers are three-point favorites after an embarrassing loss to Case Keenum and the Vikings. I'm going to have the Bucks covering. Uh, who do you have? This is Eli Manning's last gasp, I believe. I, uh, it seems like his, his career in the Giants could really be headed towards a dark place if they don't win this game. Uh, I'm not going to call it a legacy game or anything like that, but maybe the extension of his career, uh, how much longer we think he can play, may ride on this game. So I think the Giants and Eli Manning are going to come through with a win, at least on this night. Philadelphia Eagles visiting the Los Angeles Chargers. The Chargers are one-and-a-half-point favorites. Is there really a reason to think the Chargers are going to win a game ever? I was, I was just going to say that. I thought that was interesting, especially with how the Eagles have been performing. Uh, the Chargers have blown so many fourth-quarter leads, and it's just they just lost to the, the, uh, the uh, Dolphins. Like, they're not good. I don't know why they're favored in this game. I have the Eagles in a, I guess, an upset winning outright. I, I didn't think it was an upset, but sure. Uh, who do you have? That seems pretty easy to me. I'll also take the Eagles in a, in, a, in a road win. I thought this would have been at least the other way, maybe Eagles by three, but in any case, I digress. San Francisco 49ers at Arizona to take on the Cardinals. The Cardinals hung with the Cowboys for a bit last week, but still lost. The Cardinals are still a touchdown favorite, though, against the 0-3 Niners. I have the Niners plus 7. I think the Niners are going to lose, but not by that much. I feel like NFC West games are always close. So Add into the fact that the Niners had the long week off after their Thursday night game, which they looked really good against the Rams. I'm going to give them credit for that because they looked like they, I almost thought they were going to come back and win that game. Can we talk about how that might have been the best, probably was the best game of the year up to this point? Uh, I sadly was not able to watch it because all my, uh, my friends told me it was trash, but I, I watched the recap and it looked pretty exciting. Well, let me put it this way. It might not have been good until the final quarter, but the Niners came back and made it a very interesting game. But uh, that's a discussion for another time. I also have the Niners plus seven. I think the week, not the week off, but the extended time off will give them a chance to prepare, and uh, I think they'll make it a close game. Shifting from the NFC West to the AFC West, the Raiders are traveling to Denver where the Broncos are three-point favorites. Kind of interesting. Both teams were coming off of high points in Week 2 and both disappointed in Week 3. Who do you got here? I have the Raiders winning out, right? I feel like the Raiders are the more complete team here, so I'm going to stick with them. Who do you have? I'll, I'll take the Broncos to cover because of their defense and because of their home field advantage and nothing more. Uh, I think Derek Carr is going to have a not a tough day, but a rather pedestrian day, and I think in those types of conditions, that gives the Broncos the inv- advantage, although it, may, it sounds weird, but I just I can't believe Michael Crabtree and Amari Cooper each had one catch last week. That's disgusting. Come on, they're better than that, and I just I, I don't 
I don't see them playing that much better to the point where they'll be able to overcome it because now they have to play Aqib Tlaib and Chris Harris. So that'll be a tough one for them. Indianapolis Colts coming off their first win of the season, traveling to Seattle to take on the Seahawks, who are 1-2. and two. The Seahawks, however, are still 13-point favorites. What do you got here? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have the Colts plus 13. And honestly, I saw this, and I kind of wanted to bet on it because I really – so I guess the Seahawks hype isn't over because apparently they're still a super team that could just knock out everyone. So uh, who do you have? I will also take the Colts plus 13. Look, the Colts won a game. Yeah, they, they might not be that good, but they're for real. They are. They exist, you know. Uh, the, C, the Seahawks offensive line, I'm still not convinced they do. Uh, so... You know, I just I'm I'm never gonna be sold on the Seahawks this season until you know they can go a game or two without Russell Wilson getting sacked and maybe running for a hundred yards without you know giving up just three or just having three yards to carry. So you know it, it is the Seahawks at home, so they they should win, but still it's gonna be tough. Um, last game, it's the Redskins at the Chiefs. The Chiefs came off of it was another win last week i'm for some reason i'm blanking did they pl- who did they play last week oh they uh, played the chargers they played the chart i kept thinking it was the eagles but i knew that wasn't right the chiefs are seven point favorites at home and the redskins coming off that impressive win over the raiders last week are still seven point uh road underdogs i i have the chiefs staying undefeated and winning this uh they cover the spread uh, I, I think the Chiefs are actually the real deal, which I would have never guessed. I preseason, uh, we were, I was saying that the Chiefs weren't a competitor anymore and they were preparing for the future, but Kareem Hunt has uh, brought some more energy into this team. So I have the Chiefs covering, and I think they're the real deal. What do you got? You know, they, they seem like a much more dynamic team with him in the lineup, which is strange because I, I always thought Spencer Ware was a solid back, but, man, this kid is just – he's a lot better. And that's no slight to Spencer Ware either. Uh, I think the Chiefs do win this game, but I think it's close. Uh, I liked what I saw from the Redskins last week. And uh, primetime football, I don't know. I just – I feel like it's going to be a close game. So I'll take the Redskins plus seven. So that'll conclude our pick for the week. And Austin, is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap things up for today's show? Nope, just rest in peace, my fantasy team. Okay. Uh, oh, how about your favorite Steelers-Ravens moment now that uh, we, t- uh, we talked? I already mentioned the article I wrote. What's your favorite moment, I guess? Oh, oh I'm going to be such a front runner. Like, oh, you must have became a fan last year. I, that, uh... That immaculate extension pretty much took it for me. As soon as that happened, that was probably the greatest thing I've ever experienced for the Steelers Ravens. Uh, so I, I guess I'm being basic Steelers fan here and picking the thing that happened last year. But that was that won that won the division. That brought the Steelers into the playoffs. I thought, and there was an amazing play by Antonio Brown, the greatest receiver in the NFL right now. So. I just I had to go with that. What was yours? I didn't. Actually I'm I, I'm gonna agree because of everything you just said, and because I it was my first Steelers game I'd ever been to in Heinz Field with my mom. Uh, look, it's it the the last play of the game is symbolic of what the rivalry is all about. Uh, you know, Brown takes the pass; he's short of the goal line, and it's you know it's him versus the two Ravens. It just as easily could have been you know the other way. We've seen it before where they've the, the Ravens have eked out close wins too. Uh, you know, Brown gets met at the goal line and it's, you know, it's him versus them. And he reaches the ball just over the goal line with that little reach and he breaks the plane. And it's just that little, you know, it's a game of inches, they always say. And it feels like it's never more applicable than it is in this rivalry. So many close games so many hard hits, so many great plays, and, you know, oftentimes it comes down to little plays like that, and that play by Antonio Brown, you know, yeah, it was a little reach, but it, you know, went a a very long way, obviously, and it's, I think it was symbolic of the entire rivalry, and I think that's why it's my favorite moment as well, so. In conclusion, I definitely think it's the best rivalry in football, certainly over the past 10 plus years, and, uh, 
I'm very much looking forward to the renewal of this rivalry, even though the Steelers tend to not play well in Baltimore. Um, I still can't, for whatever reason, get that 2015 game in Week 16 out of my mind. That uh, or when they went to Baltimore and lost to Ryan Mallett. That game, I just that game still bothers me, and uh, I don't want to see more of that. But whatever. We're we're on to this year. Uh, hopefully, we'll see a Steelers win. But until then, Austin. Uh, thank you again for joining me today. Is there anything else you wanted to say? No. Alrighty, thank you very much, Dealer Nation, for joining us tonight. Uh, if you have any questions about the show, about the article I posted, or you want us to answer just questions about the Steelers, feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. Check out our various social media pages. We're on Instagram at stronger underscore steel underscore NFL. On Twitter at stronger underscore steel and Facebook stronger than steel podcast. Our episodes are posted to YouTube and SoundCloud under the same name, Stronger Than Steel Podcast. And check out our website, stronger than steel nfl.blogspot.com. Uh, yeah, that, that pretty much does it. Thank you very much for joining us today in Austin. Uh, I can't wait for this game. I'll uh, we'll be in contact, of course. Yes, sir. Have a good night, everybody. Take care.